The only way that God can justify, declare no longer guilty, one who is guilty is because and through the death of his son who paid sin's penalty on the cross once and for all. You cannot have salvation apart from the cross. You cannot have salvation apart from the justice of God. You cannot have salvation apart from the mercy of God. You cannot have salvation apart from the person of Jesus Christ. Today on In Touch, why did Jesus have to die? Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowd is going ahead of him, and those who followed were shouting. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred. Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance. Please, take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, and not mine. Those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest. I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. He said you were a king. Some king! I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. Take him. Let him be crucified. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. There is a very deceptive and misleading message that's being proclaimed today, and many people are being misled by it. And one of the most dangerous things about it is, is that it affects our understanding and our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and all eternity. And for people who are unbelievers, for example, they like it. It makes it possible for them to live an ungodly life and live in sin, at the same time believe that a loving Father would never, never, never allow them to be lost for all eternity. It also affects uh, people who are believers, which is something that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, the time will come when they will not endure a sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. And this is exactly what is happening. And you would think that this would not happen in a normal life. Uh, a church that would be conservative and so forth, but little by little, it's penetrating churches. And the tragedy is that many people are falling for it for the simple reason nobody has ever explained to them why Jesus Christ had to die. They just know that he did, and therefore, because he died, we can be saved and so forth. But there's far more to it than that. Many people go to church and they join a church, for example, and they're baptized, and, and you ask them if they believe in Jesus. They do. Think they're going to heaven when they die? Yes, I am. Why? And the truth is that most people, if they're honest, will say, because I'm not a bad person, and I try to do all the right things, and they very sincerely will tell you, in essence, that the basis of their acceptance by God is the fact that they're pretty good, or that they're very good, or they're not sinful, they're not wicked, and they haven't done anything deserving to be lost. And they're very sincere about it. You know, I joined three churches before I ever got saved. I joined one church. Uh, I was in Bible school, but I was uh, old enough to know what was going on. And I walked down the aisle and, uh, after that session, and they gave me a white card to fill out. I fill out the white card, my name and address, and, and why I was coming. I never heard a word, and that was the end of that. I joined another church. And uh, at the same thing, I filled out a car. It's a different denomination. And uh, I started going to church a little bit and went to Sunday school. And uh, nobody ever said anything to me about how to be saved or anything of the sort. Then I finally went to another church. And uh, every Sunday, I heard about being saved. It took three. I've thought about many times, what about all those other people that had been sitting there for years and years and years? And they listen to sermons, 
And I was wise enough to know when I heard the truth, because I was reading the Bible all the time. And my mother taught me to do that, but nobody ever explained to me what happened. And I am sure that when I preach this message today, and I want to encourage you. Now, I know sometimes people listen to watch on television, and, and uh, you're getting ready to go somewhere, and you're doing this or cooking breakfast. May, may I make a suggestion? This message is so important. Why don't you lay that other stuff down? And just listen for the next 45 minutes, which could change your whole eternal destiny. And even if it doesn't change that, It'll give you understanding of who you are, why you're where you are, and maybe what change you ought to, ought to make in your life. It has nothing to do with denominations. It has to do with what is it that the Word of God teaches about the death of Jesus Christ and its relationship to us. So I want to encourage you to listen carefully, because I want to talk about some things that are implied as a result of believing this era and this uh, kind of attitude about the Christian life in Jesus that many people have developed, and they're beginning to compromise what they've been taught and what they've heard all these years, and so therefore, maybe we ought to change our mind. Listen very carefully. I'm going to tell you exactly what the Word of God says, and the interpretation will be crystal clear. So I want you to turn, if you will, to the one of the most familiar chapters in the Bible, and that's the third chapter of John. And I want us to read these first 16 verses together because I want you to notice a couple of things, especially one thing that Jesus said that's so very important. Third chapter of John, and this chapter is about Jesus' conversation with this Jewish rabbi who is interested in discovering the truth. And so when you begin in verse 1, the Scripture simply says, now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, he was educated. He knew the law. He knew what the Old Testament Scripture said. This man came to Jesus by night because he was a little embarrassed. And he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, let me qualify that. That does not mean unless you are baptized. He was talking to a Jew. He was talking to a rabbi. They had their baptism. And John the Baptist had identified Jesus down by the Jordan when he was baptizing Jews who were coming to him for repentance. And what he was simply saying is, you know, that water baptism is fine, but you need to be baptized by the Spirit. That is, the Spirit of God needs to do something in your life also. And so he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it's coming from and where it's going, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You can't put your fingers on it, you can't touch it, you can't see it, but you can certainly feel it. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And then he brought back to Nicodemus a passage of Scripture in the Old Testament that he knew well, no doubt. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Notice he said, must be. So that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now, let's go back to that Old Testament re reference, the 21st chapter of Numbers. 
And here's what happened. The nation of Israel in the wilderness, rebelling against God, sinning against God, and they were just all out of sorts with the Lord. So these snakes came, and uh, serpents, and they began to be bitten, and they were dying. They were just dying by throngs. And so God said, Moses, you form a brass serpent. Put him on this pole, lift it up, and anyone who looks and looks with faith will be healed. So this is what he's referring to. But he noticed what he said. He said, the Son of Man must too be lifted up. Now, what was he referring to? He was referring to uh, his own crucifixion. And in the uh, eighth chapter of John, for example, uh, here again uh, is a passage that relates to the idea of being lifted up. And Jesus said in the eighth chapter of John and the 28th verse. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak those things as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. What I want you to see in this passage is simply this. This reference here is a reference to His crucifixion. And He says, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now here is the tragedy. Many people go to church and they hear all kind of sermons. And um, the conclusion is, you know, if you do your best, you're going to be okay. God loves everybody. And so the conclusion is that uh, God is a God of love. If you ask the average person today, why do you think you should go to heaven when you die? They're not going to give you the right answer. They're going to give you an answer that uh, suits them, maybe one that they have been deceptively taught. Because the deceptiveness of today's theology in many churches, and it is a growing thing. And in essence, it's this. God is such a wonderful, loving God, He has not limited His salvation to one person. That is, Jesus Christ is not the only way to be saved. And not only that, if a person is good, and a good friend, good neighbor, good to their family, go to church maybe, whatever it might be, uh, then surely they're going to heaven. Why would God not take somebody like that into heaven? Now, I'm going to show you why. That is not the way to get to heaven. It doesn't make any difference what you've been taught and who told you. The issue is this. What is the teaching of the Word of God? It has nothing to do with the denomination. It has to do with the simple truth of the Word of God. Now, if it's possible for you to go to heaven on the basis of how good you are and the fact that you believe there is a God and you believe there is a Jesus, and yes, you believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and therefore, whatever you want to add after therefore, you're going to heaven. Let me tell you what the implication of that is. If that's your idea about how to go to heaven, then here is what all that implies. Number one, that Christ's death at Calvary was totally unnecessary. While the cross, if you can be good and God accept that goodness and take you to heaven, totally unnecessary. Secondly, the implication is that God the Father made this terrible mistake. He sent His only begotten Son to die the most cruel, horrendous form of painful death possible. There's nothing to match the crucifixion. So he made a terrible mistake. Thirdly, it means that it's possible to be saved apart from Jesus Christ. Likewise, it means that you can have a personal relationship with God apart from Jesus Christ. Because after all, God is one who forgives us. And so, you know, if I'm pretty good and I do well and not wicked and sinful and vile and evil, then God is going to forgive me and I'm going to have, be able to have a relationship with Him. And it implies that God forgives us simply because He loves us. Because He loves us, He's going to forgive us, and all we have to do is ask Him. And think about this. It must have been a mistake, then, for the Christian life to be symbolized by a cross. Here's what that would be equal to today. If we said, now that we're Christians in the 21st century, let's forget the past. We're going to put, we're going to have all you folks who like to wear crosses around your neck, we're going to change those to electric chairs because they are symbols of death. There was nothing more horrendous to put around your neck or to make a symbol of your faith than a cross. 
It was the, it was the worst form of death. So that's what the implication would be. And for example, we would probably go through the hymn book and take out all of these hymns that have to do with the blood. In fact, not maybe, some folks already have done that. So all that implies is that if, I'm live, if I live good enough, God accepts me and that's it. There is nothing more damaging, more dangerous, more devastating than that kind of teaching. And yet it is just prevalent everywhere and it is moving into some churches that have been far, far more conservative than that. So I'd ask you this. Let's think back for a moment. When you were saved, what did you understand about why God forgave you? When you joined the church, did somebody set you down and say, now let me explain to you what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Let me explain to you what it means that before you join this church and before you can be baptized, you need to understand why God forgave you of your sin. You need to understand why the cross and what's that, what's that all about? Now, let's think about what this crucifixion is all about and what the truth is about Jesus Christ. So let's think about it for a moment now. First of all, Jesus' death was an absolute must in God's plan of salvation. And I want to explain that thoroughly in a moment. You remember what he said? He says the Son of Man must be lifted up. And when he's lifted up, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior will be saved. Now watch this. He says, for God so loved the world that he did something. He didn't just say, he so loved the world, he forgave us all. That's not what he said. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How did he give him? He gave him for the purpose of dying on the cross to pay our sin debt in full. If you leave that out, you miss the whole truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, believes what about him? Believes that he is the eternal son of God and that he's the sacrificial atonement for our sins. And therefore, apart from him, there is no forgiveness. So that's part of it. The second thing I want you to notice here is this, that the cross was essential for God to accomplish some desires that he had. For example, it was the desire of God that you and I would become his children, that we would be saved. It was the desire of God that you and I not only be saved, but we would have a personal relationship with God. Not just be saved, but have a personal relationship with Him. It is His desire, and was His desire in saving us, that you and I would spend our lives and invest our lives praising Him by the life of righteousness that we would live. And likewise, it was the desire of God in saving us that for all eternity we would serve Him. That's what the book of Revelation says, that we're going to be serving Him for all eternity. How we serve Him, what your position will be in heaven, is all dependent upon how we operate down here. But so God has very specific desires for us. Now, the question is, was this, in other words, if this is God's desire, what's, what's this crucifixion business about? What's all that about? Well, let's go back to Adam and Eve. You remember what God said to them? All the trees in the garden, you're welcome to them. One I have reserved for myself. The day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And you know what Satan said? Oh, but, but, but wait a minute. Not, did, did, he, did he say surely die? And so they violated the one prohibition that God had given them. Think about that. How short-sighted. All the garden, all of eternity, everything was just perfect. Somebody says, well, wait a minute. If God is a God of love, he wouldn't have put the tree there. Yet. Anyway, yes, he would. Let me tell you why. Would you like to be in a form, physically, spiritually, every other way, in which you had uh, no choices in life? You're just a, a robot. Every day of your life, this is the way you operate. You have no choices. No, you wouldn't want to live like, like that. God gave Adam and Eve a choice, which was an act of love on his part. You love me because you choose to, not because you have to. That's not really love. So he gave them a choice. They made the wrong choice. Notice what he said. The day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. These are just a few of the verses that God warns us. Listen, 
that there is a penalty for sin. That we live in a day in which we'd like to convince people there are no consequences to sin. And we don't like consequences. There are consequences to sin. There are consequences to sin that cannot be revoked. Can sin be forgiven? Absolutely. And so what we have to look at here is simply this, that the very justice of God, we said we talk about him being love. God, justice, in other words, justice and righteousness are the, are the same Greek words to some degree. And so if God is just, he's righteous. That's always does the right thing. If he's just, he always does the right thing at every turn. When he punishes sin, he's doing the right thing. If God is not just, then there's no moral law. If there's no moral law, then we, don't, we, we, we couldn't even live in this society. And so when somebody wrongs you, you want justice. Or you see someone wronging other people. You want justice done. Now, if you wrong somebody else, you say, well, you can't have it that way. <laughs> in other words, God is a just God, which means he always does the right thing at the right time in the right place in the right way. He is a just God. And he says, he is, for example, we love this verse. We say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and what? Just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, he's faithful to do it because he's true to himself. He's faithful. He makes a promise. He does it. But what about that just word? He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. That is, he will do the right thing. Because we ask him on the basis of our relationship to him, he's always going to do the right thing. He's going to be faithful in the process of doing it. God's justice is what people don't like. They want God to be freewheeling. Just give them what they want when they want it, regardless of how they live. That is not the way it is, and it never has been, never will be. There is a just God in heaven who does the right thing. And so when somebody says, well, for God to penalize his son and put this judgment of the cross upon him when he hadn't done anything wrong, then that's, that's an immoral act on the part of God. No, it's not, because that's to say that God makes mistakes, then he's immoral. No, he's not. He is a just God. Why? He said, in the day that you eat of the fruit of this tree, you shall surely die. Sin has its penalty. And because it does, and because God is who he says he is, there will be a penalty. Now, um, I, I look, for example, in... Um, Look in uh, Romans, the third chapter, and I want, I, want to read a, I want to read a couple of verses here that we all know by heart. And verse 23 of Romans 3 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We, can, we admit that. Listen to this. Being justified as a gift of His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly, speaking of the cross, as a sacrifice in His blood through faith, this was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed, speaking of the sacrifice in the Old Testament, which ultimately Jesus' sacrifice would take care of all that sin. For in this demonstration, I say of the righteousness at the present time, and I know this sounds like double talk at first, but I'm coming, so that he would be just and the justifier of he who has faith in Jesus. Now watch that. To be, watch this. To be justified means to be declared no longer guilty. For example, the Bible speaks of redemption. That is, he paid the price. He speaks of reconciliation. He brings us back into a right relationship with him. He speaks to sanctification. He sets us apart for his purposes to do his work. When he justifies us on the basis of what he did at the cross, he declares us no longer guilty. He says in Romans, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. This justification, this justice work that God does. So what did that include? Well, how could God, for example, say that if we sin against him, we're going to suffer the consequences. And then he comes along and says, for example, uh, that, that he has justified us. Well, he says, uh, he, here's what he did. He said, in order for God to be just, righteous, and holy, and at the same time declare us no longer guilty, something had to happen, and that something was the cross. So, when we think in terms of, of how all this works into God's uh, plan, if you will uh, turn, to, uh, turn to Romans chapter 5 for a moment, and look, if you will, beginning in verse 6. He says, um, 
Uh, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for who? For the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man through perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now watch this. Much more then, having now been justified, declared no longer guilty by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So as you travel through the scriptures, here's what you find. Justification and the cross are always matched up. There is no justification apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. So he's expressed his love toward us in the fact that Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for our sins in the process of doing so. This was, an, this was an act of justice on the part of God. In order for God, watch this, in order for God to listen to us and to forgive us of our sins, there had to be a basis by which this just God, who's only going to do the right thing, who said, I'm going to punish sin, how can he do that? How can, he, how can he forgive me if, if I ask him apart from the cross? He can't. You say, well, God can do anything. He can do anything but break his own law. He says he is a just God. Now, let's go back for a moment. When, it, when it's all coming in your behalf, you want him to be just. You want him to be just. You want, in other words, when you labor for him and you serve him faithfully, you want him to be just to reward you. But when you sin against God, do you still want him to be just? <laughs> no, you don't. Here's what he said. The only way that God can justify, declare no longer guilty, one who is guilty is because and through the death of his son who paid sin's penalty on the cross once and for all. You cannot have salvation apart from the cross. You cannot have salvation apart from the justice of God. You cannot have salvation apart from the mercy of God. You cannot have salvation apart from the person of Jesus Christ. So when somebody says to you, and there are lots of folks out there saying it, God, your, your God is narrow-minded. If your God says that only through his son you're going to be saved, that's very narrow-minded. Well, ask the question, why does he say it? God's not narrow-minded. I'll tell you why he's not narrow-minded. Watch this. He said, I have provided a salvation that can envelop the whole world. That's not narrow-minded. You say, well, it's by only one person. Only one person can pay the price. You see, somebody says, well, if I do good and I pay this and I do all these things, listen, you can't pay for sin. Sin is against God. Now watch this. What we forget is we have a sinful nature. We came into the world with a sinful nature. And every single one of us, we didn't sin by accident. Every single one of us has chosen to sin over and over and over again. What is God supposed to do? Just overlook that? He doesn't overlook. If he overlooked it, be unjust. He is a righteous, holy God. So he says that we are declared righteous by what? Through the death of his son. Now, I want to bring you to three or four scriptures, and I want to encourage you to turn to these because you need to, you need to see them. And let's look, uh, let's go first of all to 1 Peter and uh, chapter 1, over toward the back of, of the scriptures, 1 Peter chapter 1, and he explains this very clearly. And the whole book of Hebrews is about the, Jesus Christ being the sacrifice and so forth. 1 Peter chapter 1, listen to what he says. Verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed, not saved, not forgiven, listen, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile or empty way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Do you understand what that means? What does it mean? Look at it. See, I don't want you to just listen. Look at this. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things, that is, you weren't forgiven of your sin on the basis of 
anything physical or what you did. Like silver or gold from your futile, empty way of life. But what but redeemed, saved by the precious blood of Jesus, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. He says, we are redeemed by what? The blood of Jesus Christ, not my good works. He didn't say the blood plus. He said, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, listen, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in him. And then if you go to the uh, second chapter, for example, and look in the 24th verse. He says, and he himself, Jesus, look at this, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin, that way of life, and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. He says that our forgiveness is wrapped up in the blood of Jesus Christ, the shedding of his blood at Calvary. So if a person, and I say to you with all my heart, you go to church, you hear a sermon, come join the church, come be saved, and uh, you walk down the aisle or do whatever they ask you to do or be baptized, and, and you don't understand that your forgiveness and your cleansing and your new life and a new spirit that God offers is the result of, is on the basis of what Jesus Christ did at the cross, then you don't understand why you're forgiven of sin. And if you don't understand that and you just think, well, you know, I asked God to forgive me and He forgave me. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't operate that way. There was a price to be paid. And, and every single one of us has a price on us for our sin, and we can't pay the price. Otherwise, there'd have been no cross and no Jesus. No, he just said, just every man for himself. You confess your sin, you confess your sin, and somehow it's all going to work out. So, I, another verse I want you to look at here, uh, back in First Peter again. Look, if you will, in uh, the third chapter, and um, look, if you will, at the 18th verse. And all these verses are crystal clear. Look at this. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now, how are we forgiven? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. So when I look at these verses and I think about uh, uh, how we understand it, so I want to explain something. It's very simple. But what I've said so far is this. Sin has separated us from God. Sin cannot be taken care of by simple confession and by telling God you're not going to do it again or by going to church and paying penance or praying and whatever the ways that your church may teach that. Forgiveness comes only through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. He didn't say anybody's blood because all, all of the blood's tainted. There's only been one sinless person. Think about this. All, all those sacrifices in the Old Testament, for example, how very clear they were about how it had to be done, spotless and without blemish. That was God's message of foretelling of us that the final sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, the only sacrifice that atones for sin would be the sinless Son of God. He says, I, I must be lifted up, Jesus said. He said, listen, he said, now, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly, and I take it up willingly. So the Scripture is very clear that forgiveness comes to the shedding of Jesus' blood. So let's go back to the Garden of Eden. So God said to Adam and Eve, the day that you eat of the fruit of this tree, you shall surely die. They sinned against God. They disobeyed Him, and you know the consequences. All right? He could have said, well, this is the beginning of all things, and um, so uh, you had a choice, and you made a mistake. Now watch this. This is, this is one of the choices he could have said, but look, it, it's okay. We're going to start again, and, um, and let's just move on, which would have meant that God had violated his own law. He could never be 
fully trust it again for the simple reason the day that you eat of the fruit of this tree ye shall surely die. Not might die, surely die. That is spiritually. There is physical death, spiritual death, and eternal death. There are three forms of death. The day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And um, he could have said, okay, we, we, we just, let's forget that, not and be just. Or he could have said to them, which he did, the day that you eat of this fruit of this tree, you shall surely die, eternally separated from God. Or he could have said, you have sinned against me, you have violated my law, and justice says you're to suffer eternally. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to provide a substitute for you who will die in your place, who will take your penalty so that you will not have to die. And I will forgive you of your sins. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm eliminating all the consequences, but I'm forgiving you of your sins so that you'll not have to spend eternity separated from me because I made you for myself. Now, the justice of God will require a penalty for sin. Just telling him you're sorry and that you won't do it again, which you do, and you repent over and over and over, that, that doesn't do it. So how do, you, how do you deal with sin? Confessing sin doesn't get rid of it because you, you, how many times have we confessed and we've done the same thing over and over again? There's only one thing that deals with sin. And here's what God did. He, watch this carefully, chose to come to earth in the person, the physical body of His Son, Jesus Christ, for the primary purpose of going to the cross and dying on the cross as the ultimate and final sacrifice. And God, in those moments, took all the sin of all mankind, all of humanity, and place the guilt and the penalty of all of man's sin until he comes again, all of it, and placed it on Jesus. And at the cross, he judged. The justice of God came upon his son Jesus, and he was crucified. And in that crucifixion, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What was he doing? He was experiencing in those moments what people will experience forever when they die without Christ, separated from God. Listen, it was the one thing that Jesus didn't want. He knew he was going to the cross, but what was he saying about this cup? And why, why did he say, is there any other way? Is there any other way for us to do this besides drinking this cup? And it wasn't the crucifixion that he was referring to. It was the fact that in this, in this dying, which he came to die, is there any way to do this without you and I being separated, Father? We can't even begin to understand what divine what divine, intimate, spotless, matchless, eternal relationship meant. And suddenly, he would be wrenched from it. And he would die in his life in that on that cross and paid your sin and mine. Now, let me ask you a question. Who else could pay for your sin? Nobody. Because nobody's perfect. Only Jesus, the righteous, perfect Son of God. He went to the cross, laid down his life. He came for that purpose and took your guilt and my guilt. And now, the reason God can say to a person who walks down the aisle, for example, and let's say you kneel here and you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin and you trust him as your personal Savior based on what he did at the cross, and God says, You're forgiven, cleanse, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, justified, reconciled, sanctified. He says, You're, you're, you're glorified, you're my child forever. Wait a minute. Look at all the mess this guy, he's been in prison, uh, he, he's, he's committed all kinds of sins, messed up his family, he, he's been a drunkard, he's been on drugs, and now, what's this? It's the awesome power of that sacrifice. That's what it is. And there's nothing else. And there is nothing else in the world that can do that. Now, you remember what Jesus said? I, I love this. You remember what Jesus said when he was on the cross and uh, talking to the criminal there and uh, uh, commending his spirit to the Lord and all those things. Listen to what he said. In those last moments, he said, it, <laughs> I can only tell you this, it is finished. 
What did he mean by that? Guess what he meant? That payment for your sin, my sin, and the whole world was done. It was finished. Jesus did not go to hell. People tell you Jesus went to hell. Why would he go to hell? He paid the price. It was finished on the cross. That's where it was finished. Not I'm going to finish this up somewhere else. He, was, it was, he said it is finished. What was finished is God's redemptive plan to save mankind finished on the cross. Now, in light of what I've shared with you, which is just pure scriptural truth, compare that with this theology that says, well, if you just do better, God's going to accept you. On what basis? How much better? What you got to do? How long you got to do it? No answers to that. It is, listen, it's man's unwillingness to face his sinfulness. Listen, this is why pride is so obnoxious to God. What do we have to be proud of? He said, well, I've done so and so and so and so. You've only done what God allowed you to do. Take you off the scene in a split second. What I want you to see is this. The Scripture says, that is, God who gave us His Word said that He so loved this world that He gave as a sacrifice. Now, listen carefully. If somebody says to you, well, how do I describe all this? I can tell you how you can do it. In one single word, in one single word, you can describe what happened at Calvary. You said it must be love. No. Goodness, none of that. One word describes what happened at Calvary. Substitute. God substituted His Son in your place to die at Calvary to pay your sin debt in full so that you could be forgiven of your sins on the basis of the price He paid so that your name could be written in the Lamb's Book of Life so that you could become a child of God, so you could be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, so that you could go to heaven when you die, so you could have a personal relationship with Him, so you could be a child of God all the days of your life, and so you could serve Him for all eternity. It's all wrapped up in the cross. It's all about Jesus. So listen, the next time you hear that be good, be kind, love everybody kind of stuff, I ask this question now, where does the cross fit in that? There is no denying. You have heard the simple truth. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, because He was the only one worthy, to die a substitutionary, sacrificial, all-sufficient, atoning death at Calvary in order that man's sin debt may be paid in full and he may become a child of God. And I simply ask you this question, have you ever done that? You say, I don't think I ever understood it that way. Are you willing to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to acknowledge that you have sinned against God and rebelled against Him and lived a wicked life? From God's, from God's perspective, it's wicked rebelling against love, rejecting His plan. Are you willing to ask Him to forgive you of your sins, not based on who you are, what you've done, what you're going to do? Are you willing to ask Him to forgive you of your sins based on this simple truth that Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, went to the cross, paid your sin debt in full, and now declares you no longer guilty and a child of God based on your relationship to Him? Are you willing to do that? If you're willing to confess that sin to Him, if you're willing to repent of that sin, lay it down, yield your life to Him, He will forgive you of your sin, not based on the fact of your confession, but based on what He did and your acceptance of what He did, and now that you're including that into your life. He'll forgive your sin. The Holy Spirit will come and seal you forever as a child of God. And listen, you can live the rest of your life knowing this, that no matter what happens, where it happens, how it happens, when it happens, you are safe with Almighty God. Amen. Child of God forever.
And that is my prayer for you. I don't know what you believed before you started listening to this. I pray that you're wise enough to know that you just heard a very objective, biblical account of what God has said about His Son, the cross, and your salvation. And it's yours to believe it. And Father, how grateful we are when we think about what you have gone through, your Son, in order to atone for our sin. I pray that every person who hears this, I know the devil will attack in every way possible to get them not to believe it. But I pray the Spirit of God will penetrate all of that. And that deep down inside, they will acknowledge, even before they acknowledge it publicly or even audibly, they will acknowledge that the cross is their only hope. And we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Stanley explained today that the Bible is very clear. Accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior is the only way to heaven. When you visit our website at intouch.org, you'll find great resources to help further your study of God's Word. If you're just beginning your relationship with Jesus, check out All Things Are New, created to encourage you in your walk with Christ. In the broadcast section, you can view today's lesson online by visiting the podcast page. Get Life Principles Notes, a free download of highlights from today's message. For more resources, check out this week's sermon notes. They're online, along with more great teaching from Dr. Stanley at intouch.org. on the resurrection. Its stories of adventure, battles of faith, and life examples are just as true, just as exciting as ever. Rediscover the treasure of God's Word with the Charles F. Stanley Life Principles Bible, filled with clear explanations, unique and compelling features, and life lessons in every book and chapter, plus the 30 life principles that have guided Dr. Stanley's life and ministry. The Life Principles Bible. Order yours when you call toll-free or visit intouch.org. What is your greatest desire in life? Is it for success and recognition, for comfort and ease, a long life and good health? Or is it your heart's desire for God's peace, a knowledge of Him, and the salvation of your family and friends? Well, the psalmist tells us how our heart's desire can be fulfilled. And today's email seeks a little more explanation about this. So the viewer writes, Psalm 37 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. I think I know what my heart's desire is, but I'm not sure how to delight myself in the Lord. Also, if I'm fully delighting in God, will my heart's desire somehow change? Well, God's promise is very clear in Psalm 37 when He says, Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Now, the first question is this. Is your desire the will of God? He doesn't just promise to give anything. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. But the desires of your heart must be in keeping with His plan, His purpose, and His will for your life. If that's not true, then you're praying in vain. And let me tell you why. God loves you too much to give you something that is not good for you. Now, you in your own determination can reach out and make something happen. But if it's not of God, it's not going to work. It's not going to please you. It's not going to satisfy you at all. Now, 
when you ask the question, well, what do you mean delight myself? Well, that's his requirement. Listen to what he says. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. If you delight yourself in the Lord, here's what that means. That means to be pleased with him, to experience great pleasure and joy in knowing him, to take pleasure in obeying and trusting him, talking to him in prayer, listening to him, developing an intimacy with him, guard and cultivate that relationship. What it says is that you're committed to his will. And if all those things be true, then what you're doing is you're delighting yourself in him. And notice, none of that had to do with what you desire. It has to do with the fact of your relationship to him. When that's right, God will grant you the desires of your heart. When that desire is in keeping with his will, his timing, his purpose, and his plan for your life. What does that require? It requires that you and I surrender our life to him. If you want God to give you his best, you must surrender yourself to him in such a fashion that he then can grant you the best, the desires of your heart, his will and purpose for your life. Well, thank you for joining us for this broadcast of In Touch. An awareness of God's presence energizes us for everything we do. So grow close to him and then watch him work. Touching the world with a passion for God and compassion for people. In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley is a presentation of In Touch Ministries. This program is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.